Um, this is the second panel, The Politics of Rule of Law. I'm Lynn Welshman from the Law School. I'd like to thank Nimmer for doing me the honour of inviting me to chair and for doing all the work in assembling this wonderful panel. We haven't got... We're a bit late, but that's not our fault, so we're going to catch up. Um, and I'm not going to read out the bios, but you have the conference papers which have the, the rather stunning CVs of my panellists here, so I'll leave those to you to have a look at. Each panel is going to have 15 minutes uh, rather than 20, so we can get to questions and discussions quicker at the end. And also, because I'm anticipating that perhaps we'll have some questions and discussions that go to the first panel and how these two match up. So we want to leave a little bit more time for discussion at the end, perhaps. Is this on? Can you all hear me? Mm, OK. Um, uh, also, because I think I've noticed with some people, they tend to talk slower as Friday sort of wears on, you know. It doesn't apply to me. I'll, I'll hesitate to... I'll, very quick to tell you, it doesn't apply to me at all. Um, so I thought we're going to have 15 minutes and then, then, and then more time for people to ask slower questions after the end of that. We'll aim to finish it just after seven. So our first panellist is Hiba Morayev, um, who's a human rights defender, a former director of Human Rights Watch in Egypt, and before that, we met when you were in Amnesty, I think. Um, and she is going to be speaking on Egypt, on the meanings... The meanings of the rule of law in Egypt. Hiba. Go over there. Just so. You're very welcome. Glad to have you with us. So you're standing, stay awake. Thanks. And I'll, I'll try very hard to stick to my 15 minutes. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about how, about, and of course, there are lots of different meanings of rule of law, but what rule of law, what notions of rule of law have meant to us in the human rights community in Egypt. And I have uh, the perspective very much of a practitioner. I've been out of academia for 10 years, not very good on theory. But I did want to talk to, but, I, but what I do think is interesting is, is how the, the value of using notions of rule of law has shifted so drastically over the last four years and the longer term implications of this for human rights work in Egypt, which ultimately rests on selling law, selling you know, selling rights uh, that are rooted in, 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 in Egyptian law. Um, of course, there's nothing new with comp having competing narratives of uh, rule of law uh, and, and legitimacy. Um, the, under the Mubarak, the Egyptian MFA was uh, very skilled at uh, talking about the rights that exist in the 71 constitution and at countering uh, whatever uh, documentation and, and narratives that were coming out of the human rights community at the time. Um, but um, for us, under the Mubarak, uh, in, in the Mubarak era, doing, doing human rights work and calling for respect for the rule of law meant calling for accountability for security forces, um, countering the impunity that the regime enjoyed in terms of those abuses and in terms of corruption. It also meant an end to administrative detention and the exceptional um, court system. And it, it also meant an end to government disregard of you know, some of the progressive decisions that came out of the administrative courts um, or, or even some of the, the rights that existed um, in the constitution or in different laws. And it also meant uh, calling for judicial independence. And, and you see that throughout the last decade of uh, the Mubarak era in, in particular. Um, for me, what 2011 meant most was an opportunity to try to shift the balance of power between the security services and the judiciary. So a lot of the things, a lot of the calls that you would hear throughout the uprising in, in early 2011 were related to accountability, to the rights of victims, were related to justice. Um, we want to be a country of law as opposed to sort of the barbaric, uh, arbitrary nature of all that came before. Um, these were powerful ideas uh, during the uprising. So I, I'm not claiming that um, that this was the essence uh, of the uprising, but there were um, possibly, you know, large sections of the list of people that Hidayat had on, a, on, a, on that list were phrasing some of the demands in uh, legal terms. Fast forward to the summer of 2014, when the government and um, the state and, and the private media uh, justify the killing of over 1,000 people in one month um, by saying that this was saving the state uh, against um, you know, the barbaric onslaught of um, Islamism. Um, this is a moment where, and, and, and is able to get away with it internationally and domestically for now. 
On the one hand, that summer, the government, um, I mean, the new regime felt that they had a legitimacy gap. So they shifted very, very quickly into um, a PR campaign that was um, aimed, of course, specifically at the United States because of uh, the coup legislation uh, implications for military aid, but more generally, uh, a, a PR campaign that to say that this was not a coup. And uh, to make these not a coup arguments, uh, many of which were very, very convoluted and, you know, self-contradictory, um, the government would frame things in terms of respect for rule of law. So, and I think that actually the longer term implications of a lot of these measures that they took, and I want to go through a few of them, uh, have been incredibly destructive for the very notion of the rule of law in Egypt longer term. So for example, the regime, Sisi doesn't, um, I mean, Sisi takes center stage, I would argue, on July 27th, uh, July 26th, when he calls for uh, the people to uh, give him a mandate to fight terrorism. He kind of, you know, before that, you have the notion of a coalition, of a June 30th coalition. Um, but one could also argue that Sisi takes center stage on June 1st, when he first gives Morsi a 48-hour ultimatum. But Sisi doesn't take power formally. Instead, he installs a judge, the head of the Supreme Constitutional Court. And I think here again, the longer term implications of this judge having sat over this transition and having held legislative, legislative authority and having issued a number of laws, uh, many of which will, will probably turn out to be, will probably eventually be ruled unconstitutional. One already has the election law. I mean, the current crisis that we're in of elections having been postponed is precisely because the election law that he issued um, was found to be unconstitutional. The longer term implications of that, um, I mean, this, this is, this is a, an act which will also have, have longer implications implications. So under Mubarak, calling for rule of respect for the rule of law meant um, wanting to end emergency state security courts, um, because these were courts created by the emergency law, and these were the ones you know, notorious for um, sentencing dissidents, notorious for failing to uphold due process guarantees, uh, and for always ignoring uh, torture, and for sentencing people based on confessions extracted under, under torture. Um, Mansour... Um, so at the time, sorry, I, I keep jumping around a little bit, but at the time under Mubarak, we would use the judiciary for strategic litigation. We would turn to the judiciary to fight procedural arguments to get people out of detention. If people had been sentenced by a prosecutor order, there was a good chance that by arguing on due process uh, on, on grounds, on procedural grounds, you could actually get a few releases here and there. Um, so in a sense... Our goal was to move people from out of the administrative detention regime into the regular court system so you, because the judiciary was kind of the hope of oversight over um, that administrative detention regime set up by the, which was solely controlled by the Ministry of Interior. Now, that administrative detention regime was created by the emergency law, and this is why uh, the call for an end to the state of emergency, which is something you also heard during the uprising, was so emotive. Now, honestly, if you ask most people what the emergency law was, how many provisions it had, what was bad about it, these are very technical questions that most, most people wouldn't, really wouldn't be able to answer what the problem was, but it had somehow become representative of everything that Mubarak's police state stood for. So... Um, this is why the state of emergency was eventually not renewed. Um, and, um, P and then it was only renewed after the dispersal of the two sit-ins in August 2013. The interesting thing is, is that at the point w when the state of emergency was declared, which, you know, actually in terms of the definition, yeah, this would actually qualify factually as grounds for declaring a state of emergency, at least for those... Um, first couple of weeks in terms of could qualify potentially for the declaration of a state of emergency, but the the government uh, and then impose a curfew on the basis of that state of emergency. But interestingly, they didn't activate the administrative detention provision within the emergency law, which um, had been used, you know, under Mubarak to detain uh, tens of thousands of people. And the reason, of course, we were against administrative detention is that there's no uh, judicial oversight, um, high potential for torture. 
um, and very little chance of, um, of, of, of actual release. But the reason they didn't use the administrative detention is that the Supreme Constitutional Court had a few months earlier declared that provision unconstitutional. And I suppose it could have been due to the fact that Adli Mansour you know, was president of that court and was now president of the country, so it might have been taking it one step too far to then completely you know, to ignore that ruling and go back to administrative detention. But more importantly, the regime had actually learned that it didn't need administrative detention. They could throw everybody into pretrial detention and continue to renew pretrial detention again and again and again for over a year without charging people, and they could get away with it. And, and so today, the crisis that we're in, in, in terms of detaining um, uh, either opposition members or uh, activists, is in fact that it's the regular judiciary. It's no longer the, you know, it's no longer the Ministry of Interior and the Ministry of Detention, and it's no longer state security courts. It's the regular judiciary that is responsible for the detention of tens of thousands of people today. The, the highest number confirmed by the authorities was 22,000, but uh, independent estimates by lawyers um, for this project Wikisaura have determined that 41,000 people are detained in, in, in pretrial detention. So this again has has longer term implications um, because the judiciary, which was you know never a full ally for us in the human rights community, but at least a judiciary that had of mixed repute, let's say some judges who would sit there and sentence dissidents uh, and as I said, you know t uh, sentence people based on uh, confessions that extracted on the torture, but other judges who were either sometimes progressive in the administrative courts, in particular in the Council of State, um, ruling on questions of state policy by the government, um, but at other times judges who really just wanted to apply procedure as it was. So were conservative in their general leanings, but every now and then would actually come up with um, a, positive, uh, a positive ruling. Now, where we are today is uh, a huge crisis for the judiciary because um, I, because it's, it's clear that the judiciary as a whole has taken an ideological stance in support of the regime post summer of 2013. And that even those judges who could have been potential allies for the human rights community, for those sections of the human rights community who are still operating as independent human rights defenders, let's say, and who are still uh, representing cases of Islamists, because for me that's the main criterion for, for that distinction today. Um, you, you don't have allies in the judiciary today, uh, people who are willing to stick their heads up uh, and, and, and at least uh, and, and make progressive rulings. And, and fear is a very operative factor. Um, we, also, we also have, um, the, the regime has also chosen to shut down on political space by either enacting new laws like the protest law or referring to Mubarak era laws like the NGO law. So again, in early 2011, uh, a new protest law was one of the main demands that was floated around. And, you know, Hidayat, in terms of what you're saying about this obsession with constitutionalism, one of my regrets or one of my lessons learned is that I wish there was more obsession with uh, legislative reform as opposed to constitutional reform, because in fact, it's it's usually these laws, it's penal, penal code provisions and laws like the protest law, the NGO law, that have been um, the, the most effective tools for the regime, uh, in particular in, in, in you know the, the full-blown counter-revolution that we've seen recently. So the production of these new laws, again, uh, issued under Morsi's watch, and in fact, the way these, these laws have been implemented it has allowed the regime and the pro-state media, which is basically all the media right now, both state and private, to keep this narrative alive of, well, it's the law. Those kids want chaos. Those protesters want chaos. We are upholding the law. And it's made even you know, the most sympathetic of cases, somebody like Yara Salem, who's a human rights defender, a good friend of many of us, who's been in prison um, since June of last year, Usually those kinds of, I mean, t to be very um, um, to be very cynical about it, these are the kinds of cases that are much easier to get media attention and to, to get public sympathy for. Even cases like her um, can be justified by, well, she didn't respect the law. So you can produce um, or reproduce repressive laws because, again, in terms of this protest law, all it did was incorporate criminal penalties that, of the existing laws on assembly, which actually date from the days of the British. It's the 1914 and 1923 laws. Um, so it was a reproduction of a Mubarak era law, but used, again, to legitimize a crackdown on, on political space. In my final two minutes, um, the other two things I want to no, I mean, the one the one remaining big thing is impunity and accountability. Because I think the one difference you had about 2011, and the one reason that we saw the police, we saw law acting as a constraint upon the police throughout 2011. Um, 
I would big picture, and I'll tell you why, was because of the trials. Um, so you had over there's there's a lot of focus on the Mubarak trial because that's sort of the big you know the big policy trial with the senior the senior ministers of interior. But I think the more, far more interesting trials are actually the police station trials that were uh, took place around the country. And so if you had 172 police officers put on trial in 38 different trials. And uh, in these cases, you know, the police would very often talk um, during and after those trials on television and the media about the insult of having been dragged through the courts. I mean, that idea of being tried, being prosecuted for killing 846 protesters was a, was a deeply traumatic event. And I would argue, based on what we were documenting at the time, acted as a check to a certain extent, acted as a check to a certain extent on their excesses. So fast forward to today, where you have absolute impunity, uh, you not only have the police being able to shoot unarmed women like Shem Esab, this last January, and, and the one exception, in fact, to the general impunity that the police have enjoyed under CC for killing protesters is her case, because a police officer has just been referred to, to, to trial. Um, but other than that, you have police officers now shooting ex fiancés You have them they're using live ammunition at checkpoints. A police officer shot a patient chained to a hospital bed um, in January uh, and, and then publicly justified it, including the Ministry of Interior, by, by saying that the patient had insulted him. So there's no pretense even now on the part of the Ministry of Interior to, to, need, to, you know, to need to pretend that it's not using live ammunition um, or, or to, they have a sense of new empowerment by the absolute impunity that they that they've enjoyed. Longer term, concluding point is that I think we're in a moment of crisis as a human rights community um, that, that is even worse, I would claim, than the 1990s. And I, and I say this based you know, having spoken to people, to, to some of the human, Egyptian human rights offenders who were working in the 1990s. So we haven't gone back to the late Mubarak era because in the late Mubarak era for the last 10 years, we could at least um, operate um, and, and had some allies within the system who wanted you know, the, the Gamal Mubarak crowd who cared about their image in the West and were, acted as a moderating influence from the government or certain people within the judiciary who would cooperate on procedural grounds. But the regime really does seem to have won this round and it puts us in a position of not being able to work in the way that we used to work uh, under Mubarak when thinking about how do we how we use the law and who we turn to within the legal system to uh, uphold more progressive interpretations of human rights. So I suppose, I mean, without ending on, on, on too depressing um, a note, I mean, the, the, the two things I can leave you with is on the one hand, uh, this is an opportunity to think about what what useful lessons can be learned. And I think the biggest one uh, that is that you, when given an opportunity like the January 2011 uprising, that opportunity, you have a very short space of time and you have to use it very strategically. And part of that, I would say, legislative reform uh, very early on. Uh, don't assume that history is on your side and that history will remain on your side. And don't assume that the uh, deeply embedded um, forces in the Egyptian state, I mean, one, one can argue how much of a transition there was anyway in February 2011, um, but there was at least an opportunity. And I think, I think the you know, progressive forces who approached January 2011 underestimated the challenges uh, that they were up against. And I mean, the final, final, final note is that, uh, no, is that um, this round has been lost by the human rights community, but I still think that the effects of January 2011 are unpredictable. And a state that's trying to reconstruct a state of the 1990s st still doesn't quite know what it's dealing with. That, I have to end on a slightly optimistic, I was waiting for that. Thank you very much, Heba. Our next speaker is Dr. Adam Hania from the Department of Development Studies at SOAS, who's going to talk about state building, economy, and the rule of law, mostly focused on Palestine this time, I think, yes. right? Yes. Okay, thank you. So, yeah, uh, thank you very much for the opportunity uh, to speak today, and uh, it's great to be on the panel with our guests. Uh, I do want to speak on something a little bit different from the cases of uh, Tunisia and Egypt, and that is uh, looking specifically at the question of uh, the Palestinian Authority and what we can learn about the relationship between state building, the rule of law, and the political economy uh, that has unfolded under the Palestinian Authority over the last uh, few years. I know the, the Palestinian case has not really been a major focus of the Arab uprisings, but I think it it is a case that uh, is very illuminating 
uh, to turn to when we think about what might happen in other parts uh, of the Arab world. Uh, and that is because the case of the, the PA, the Palestinian Authority, has really been a major focus of uh, institutional uh, uh, donor support uh, and aid um, over the recent decade. And I think we can see it very much uh, as, a, as a laboratory, if you like, uh, for some of these debates around uh, state, state building. Now, and I think we can see that the language that we've seen, we, can, we, we notice in the Palestinian case replicated uh, in the cases of, of Tunisia and Egypt in, in recent times. Now, there's a lot uh, to the state formation debate that I, uh, and state building debate that I, I don't have time to deal with, but uh, I just want to emphasize at the beginning two kind of key theoretical uh, propositions that underlie uh, the, the way this is understood in policy terms. Um, the first is, and this I think is, is a key point, is that there has been an explicit linkage uh, posited between democratization or, or democracy promotion and market-led uh, market models uh, of development. Um, the creation of liberal democracies and market-based economies uh, are said by uh, 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 donors, by uh, actors involved in, in, in the process in Palestine and, and across the region to be mutually reinforcing processes. And uh, we can see this clearly in the way that uh, it's framed by the IMF, the World Bank, and other actors. We can also see it, I think, and this relates very much to the, to the cases of, of Tunisia and Egypt, uh, in the uh, international financial institution discussions around the Duvel Partnership, uh, which was a, 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 an institution set up in May 2011, following the, the uprisings in Egypt and Tunisia, uh, and which has promised $40 billion in loans and other aid um, towards what's called the Arab countries in transition. Uh, and very clearly in the Duval partnership, we can see this kind of market-led or neoliberal um, orientation um, attempting to roll out new lo loan agreements and assistance that are in essential continuity with past programs, um, emphasizing, in other words, private sector-driven growth, uh, fiscal austerity, particularly around subsidy and pension reform, uh, and the liberalization and deregulation of financial and labor markets. So. Uh, I think this is this is an important uh, this is an important first point this this kind of neoliberal or market based uh, model of development that underlies the approach to state building uh, in, in 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 the region. The second uh, is the claim that effective state building is causally related to more uh, peaceful. Uh, or less violent uh, states. So drawing upon Kantian conceptions of representative democracy and the international relations between states, this uh, so-called liberal peace uh, perspective claims that if a state is governed along liberal democratic lines, then it will be less likely to go to war because of the inherent reluctance of the population to engage in military, uh, in military conflict. Uh, as one um, perceptive critic noted, it, you can basically understand this in, in the phrase, democracies do not go to war with one another. So uh, there's, as I said, there's a lot more to, to kind of the state building approach, but um, I want to just turn now to look at what this means in the case of the, of the Palestinian uh, Authority. Uh, because this approach, what I've outlined, very much governs um, how uh, PA state building has emerged uh, since particularly 2007. Okay, this is, this is the kind of the key moment. And in 2007, uh, the PA adopted something called the uh, Palestinian Reform and Development Pro uh, Program, the P PRDP, uh, or Palestinian Reform and Development Plan, actually, uh, which, which covered from 2008 to 2010. Now, what the PRDP did was set out the basic lines of development uh, under the Palestinian Authority, particularly focusing on the West Bank. At this point, there had been the, the split between the West Bank and uh, and Gaza Strip. Uh, this program, uh, it, it, as I said, it, it went to 2010, but um, uh, since then there have been uh, other plans developed, the Palestine National uh, Development Plan, the PNDP, uh, which has continued basically to follow the same kind of, of models. So it's governed um, all aspects of Palestinian development uh, and uh, echoes very much other initiatives that we see coming from the Quartet uh, and the World Bank, as well as uh, from things like the Kerry Initiative uh, that we saw last year. So what did the PRDP say? 
Um, it explicitly confirmed the neoliberal orientation of state building. Um, it committed the PA to implement or undertake a series of fiscal reforms that aim to reduce public expend expenditure on public sector wages and employment. And the overall goal was to reach, uh, and this is a quote, a diversified and thriving free market economy led by a pioneering, pioneering private sector in harmony with the Arab world and open to regional and global markets. That's a quote from uh, the PIDP itself. So external donor, fun donor funding to the PA was based on the implementation of the PIDP. And in fact, these uh, the, the flows of capital, the, the flows of aid to the PA were, were channeled through a World Bank trust fund uh, or World Bank administered trust fund headed, headquartered uh, in, in Washington. Constitutionally, I'm not a lawyer, but um, uh, I will say just one thing about the Constitution, how, what this means. Uh, it has meant that neoliberalism has actually been enshrined in the Palestinian uh, uh, Basic Law. Article 21 of the Palestinian Basic Law uh, explicitly states, and this is a quote, the Palestinian economic system shall be based on a free market economy. Uh, I don't know how widespread this, uh, this kind of constitution constitutional embedding of free market or, or neoliberal principles is, um, but I think uh, 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 Palestine is, is, uh, the Palestinian Authority is a very clear example of how this twinning um, uh, occurs. So uh, there's a lot that can be said about the PRDP. Um, we can see it uh, in terms of the development uh, of industrial zones uh, in, in near Janine and Jericho. We can see it in the uh, explicit orientation towards private sector-led development uh, in the housing and real estate markets, uh, and particularly the development of mortgage markets and hence debt relations um, for Palestinians uh, over the last over the last uh, uh, decade, essentially. So. Uh, the other side to the P to the PA uh, state formation uh, uh, program or state building program has been, of course, and this was very much a, a, a component of uh, the PRDP, was the question of security. Um, and what this meant was that the security budget received the largest portion of funding um, uh, within within the PA, going to training of new police forces and establishing uh, prisons and new prisons. Uh, now, in this manner, PA state formation was largely conceived through building both the neoliberal capacity of state institutions and developing the monopoly of violence uh, within the territories administered uh, by the PA. And of course, uh, foreign aid, uh, uh, which underpinned the budget, um, was very much an enabling factor within this. So. What have been the consequences of this kind of state building uh, model and, and how can we think about this in terms of other processes in the Arab world? Now, a lot of uh, scholars and activists have commented on the way that this model uh, of state building has acted essentially to incorporate Israeli settler colonialism into uh, uh, the way that the PA operates um, in the West Bank. Um, it has led to an ineffective and collaborationist, in many respects, political orientation on behalf of the PA. But I think the other side uh, that is often left out is that the PA's state building model has primarily acted to support the growth of a handful of large uh, Palestinian uh, economic conglomerates that dominate almost every aspect of the domestic economy in the West Bank. Um, we can see this in virtually all sectors uh, of the economy. In housing, for example, uh, uh, where real estate development is controlled by just three uh, private uh, uh, and state-owned firms that are closely connected to the Palestinian Authority. In banking, where 15 out of 17 of the banks uh, that operate in the West Bank are also uh, controlled by these same conglomerates. In telecommunications, in trade and retail sectors, and in the aforementioned development of industrial zones. So uh, this is one side of where state building has led in Palestine. The other side to this has been uh, growing levels of inequality and fragmentation within Palestinian society, um, uh, very much connected to the, the spread of debt relations I, I mentioned uh, earlier. OK, I'm going to uh, just move on, though, to say what does this tell us about uh, how we understand state building and the rule of law? The first thing I think these trends point to is the importance of reconsidering the inherent relationship between economic processes and political and indeed legal forms. 
Too often, I think, we conceive of these spheres, the politics and economics, as being separate. Uh, we treat them uh, separately. And I think we can see this in many of the contemporary debates today in the region, um, where the focus has been on building liberal democracies uh, or new constitutional models, but keeping in place the same types of economic policies that preceded 2011 and 2012. We can see this um, in the Duval partnership that I mentioned uh, earlier. We can see it in the way that Western governments and institutions continue to orient towards these so-called transition states, i.e. there's a narrow focus on political issues encompassed in themes like governance, voice, accountability, but uh, the, the emphasis is on continuing uh, the same kinds of neoliberal economic reforms. Liberalized markets in this approach are seen to be apolitical and separate from the question of political power. I would argue, though, in contrast to this separation of the political and economic, uh, and agreeing with many other scholars on this, on, this, on this point, that we need to see these spheres as fused. Political forms reflect and mediate economic power. And this is why in the Arab world there's been such a close association between authoritarian forms of rule and neoliberalism. Let's not forget that in 2008 the Mubarak regime was awarded uh, the world's uh, top reformer, uh, economic reformer, by the World Bank uh, in 2008. So it was held up very much as a model for the rest of the region uh, uh, to follow. In other words, we need to understand the state as an institution that is never and cannot be neutral. Rather, it should be understood as a form of appearance of the social relations that constitute uh, society, as an institutional form of these, uh, uh, of these social relations. Seen in this manner, the separation between politics embodied in the state and a supposedly independent civil society encompassing the market is illusory, even as a normative goal. Academic approaches that present the ideal of liberal democracy as the desired policy end, supposedly guaranteeing the same rights and responsibilities for all civil society actors, regardless of wealth, social status, or accident of birth, act to obscure the reality of social power that is fundamental and foundational to the ways that markets work. So uh, the conclusion that I think we can draw from this is that this connection between the political and economic is particularly important to emphasize today, as it points to the necessary linkage between the struggle to address uh, socioeconomic inequalities uh, in places like uh, uh, Tunisia, Egypt, and very much today in Palestine as well, this, this, this uh, question of, of, of differences in socioeconomic power, and the, uh, those uh, efforts aimed at political reform. These things are bound up together. Questions of constitutional forms, electoral systems, political participation uh, 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 cannot be separated from these uh, ongoing and deepening socioeconomic inequalities. So we need to address these inequalities and I think attempt to reverse and question the kinds of market-led development models that we saw in Palestine, but also we see very much, I think, unfolding in the cases of Egypt and Tunisia today, if we are going to see any kind of effective and real political change. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. And our next panelist speaker is Dr. Afaf Jebari. We're very happy to say doctor because me and Nadi were both on her committee, so we'd like to say well done, Afaf, again. <laughs> and a very good PhD it was too. Um, <laughs> oh, they're all good. She I'm says this much. now, before. <laughs> <laughs> um, Afaf is talking, is, well, so much PhD, she's now at lecturer at Roehampton, um, and she's going to talk to us on, she's used the word revolution, then we didn't have the morning session. And I insist on it, actually. Uh, gendering the Arab revolutions, women's rights, and the challenge of insecurity. Okay, thank you very uh, much, Lynn, and uh, I might want to take you a little bit away from law and constitutions to... Uh, but also in a related uh, issue that is linked to what you have been, actually the speakers of this conference have been talking about, which is the issue of how that's compromised, for instance, constitution, or how the constitution that 
serve interests of the states or how the chaos of uh, uh, and the situation in Yemen or in Libya is impacted upon lived realities of, of people. And in particular, I want to talk about the realities or how uh, activists, whether human rights activists or political activists, how they do look or how they do perceive the, the, the current stage of the revolution. And I call it current stage of revolution because I don't think it has ended. It is still on. It is just one stage of so many stages that we are going uh, through. So when speaking to so many of these activists, actually, what do you feel from, from them is that there is a sense of loss. A sense of loss, if I want just to personalize it for, for some of you, um, as if you are uh, MA students doing your uh, dissertation or a PhD uh, student doing uh, your thesis or uh, a, a scholar who's working in an idea for years and trying to conceive it and when just he or she is so satisfied with this idea and putting it into a very strong, beautiful piece of writing, he or she has to give the credit for someone else, and not just to give the credit, but also this person or a group, etc., turn this piece of paper to something opposite to what you meant it to be. Turn it to something that is stranger to you, something alien to you. So you are no more identified with your own work. You don't feel it, actually, and you cannot defend it. You look at it as, as something alien. And this kind of loss, actually, because so many people, when they looked at the revolution, they looked at it, although so many criticize revolutions that they do have only slogans, but for so many people, revolutions, including mine, including me, uh, revolutions meant maybe finally that we do have our own liberation project. Maybe it's coming true. Maybe it's, uh, it's the end of, uh, of uh, colonialism in, in the region. Maybe it's the end of all independences in, in, in the region. So that's why the loss is great for, for, for those activists. And for women, even the loss is greater and doubled because in one part they have lost uh, uh, as same as men, uh, their aspiration for this uh, liberation project, and on the other, they lost their own uh, aspiration for their own liberation project. Tahrir Square wasn't just or other squares in the region in Libya or in Sana'a or uh, Tunis were not just safe places. They were places where women finally kind of realize themselves as part of, of humanity, their essence as human, not as half-minded, not women who need guardianship, not women who need protection. So that sort of sense of loss is greater for them because uh, because of that. So, and I call it sense of loss because I don't want it to be fear because when you, those people just two years or three years ago didn't fear death, didn't fear killing, didn't fear being arrested or, or, uh, or, uh, or anything. So for that, for them, actually, and this, an ordinate, drastic sense of loss, um, uh, for for so many people, and as I said, for uh, for uh, for women in particular, I wanted to discuss it, and it's from the outset of of the revolution uh, that, uh, and in a way, actually to restore power, the the, the regime's power, there was a connection between law. Uh, between ideological, uh, uh, patriarchal ideology, state uh, mechanisms, uh, political economy, as uh, it has been uh, uh, just discussed, and so many other aspects that it tried to that form the whole system of excluding women, and not just excluding them, but also creating material and ideological conditions to alienate them from the revolutions and creating conditions where they are estranged and they are exposed to uh, to different forms uh, forms of violence and here i will analyze how this happened through karl marx's theory of alienations and i will take three aspects of it the first aspect is the alienations from the process of producing revolution the second is the alienation of the act of revolution of women itself. And the third is the alienation from the products of, of, the, of the revolution. Uh, and for the first, uh, for the first aspect of, uh, of alienation, it has 
been manifested in the ways in which women from the beginning of the revolution where their state and their struggle was uh, perceived or portrayed as something exceptional, as a state of exception. It's not the norm. Women are not normally joining a force and they are not normally in the street defending their rights. So in this way, and I'm sure you have all seen like uh, headlines, the Telegraph or news, uh, New York Times or Guardians of women finally are in the front lines. Women are shoulder to shoulder with men. Women are taking their uh, rights and women are demanding. And finally, on in this world, actually, so much emphasis on finally, as women have never been part of, uh, of the revolution, as they have never been actually, they are not the one who contributed in producing the revolution itself. We, have, we all know that women's NGOs or women's movement in the region, whether individual activists or whether women's organization have continued to work under excessive harsh conditions uh, under the dictatorships in, in different countries, whether in Syria, in Iraq, in, in Egypt. Or, so they have produced the revolution. And this effort uh, wasn't actually uh, recognized in the ways in which their contribution in the revolution was perceived and trying to make them alien to this proje process of, uh, of, of production. Uh, the other thing is the exceptional, exceptionalization of uh, that made uh, particularly to a particular woman from particular party, political party, or f even from particular class or particular power position, that they are made the revolution. They are the ones, the heroine ones, the ones who take all of the awards. We in each country there is only one identified woman or two maximum that everyone recognizes that she is the one who made this revolution, while other ordinary women, if we can, uh, the majority of women who were part of the revolution and who have fought as same as others, or maybe they created their own ways of resistance, their revolution or their uh, contribution in the revolution wasn't recognized. Last week I was in New York participating in um, uh, the CSW conference, which is uh, the United Nations Conference on, on Women. And I have presented a video for, uh, I'm, sure, I'm not sure if you have uh, seen it, but it's a video for an elderly woman who uh, from uh, Raqqa in Syria, who challenged ISIS, and who challenged ISIS by reading it from the Quran and showing that how Islam is peaceful by reading these particular uh, verses of Quran and the way she did it that she silenced them by Quran and she actually was really amazing and shows us how women with specific knowledge of just Quran and uh, some old traditional proverbs have the courage to uh, to face ISIS militants without without any fear and actually one the first question I was asked about this woman is how authentic is the video and that was really amazing. And instead of looking at what she was doing and how she uh, used her own knowledge and resisted uh, Daesh, we are in a position to say if the video was authentic or not. And this is maybe because this ordinary woman has challenged the scholar who identify herself actually as a scholar and a human rights, an American scholar and a human rights activist, her ideology or her stereotypes of women in the region as passive, passive victims that they do not uh, uh, stand for their own issues or maybe because of the issue that there are some aspects of peace in, in Islam. So in all of this, you see that women still we do have this orientalist understanding and stereotypical of images in the region as all passive and only we have two or three here when brave active women who are doing uh, all of uh, all of the other work uh, the other actually aspect of uh, of alienation which is the act of revolution itself which was denied to women and we see how the shift has happened like from the beginning women were active participants to just one month after Egyptian revolution or uh, other revolutions, uh, where women were shown as passive victim of uh, uh, sexual violence, of uh, harassment, of, uh, of rape. So this shift made that women 
are not more active political active political activists, but they are more exposed to violence and uh, and harassment. And this has too many actually. Uh, Purposes. The, the, the first is to threaten other women, to use as a weapon by states and non-state alike, that to threaten women and silence other, and at the same time to uh, to produce another image of women rather than the one that the world have uh, have seen have seen in uh, in the revolution. The other image also you can see through. The last elections in Egypt, uh, uh, where we have seen women only as dancers of, of the election. The first time I seen a, an old woman dancing in the election, it was actually nice. Uh, but then, <laughs> but then this, these videos started to be, to be uh, repeated to the extent that you see nothing about women in the election process but, but dancing. And even in the press conference, of uh, announcing the uh, the results, there were also women dancing. Not journalists, not politicians, not uh, observers of the elections, but but women women's dancing. Last time I was in Egypt uh, in January, and I was doing a focus group with uh, women from a marginal, very marginalized area, and a woman told me, "This is the last time I vote." And I asked her why, and she told me, "Now boys, when they want to humiliate each other, they tell each other that." Your mother went to election, which means your mom was a dancer in the, in the election. So it's been used. So these images are not just innocent images of, of women. They have been used deliberately as a gender construction, as a way in which to, to show that men are working in politics and women are doing uh, the dancing. The other recent image, actually, which is... Uh, image of women who are joining uh, ISIS and the division of labor between men and women joining uh, ISIS. We see that uh, when it started to hear about women from Tunisia going to, to join uh, Daesh, uh, the only issue that emerged is the nikah uh, al-jihad, the uh, uh, sexual intercourse, the whole, uh, etc. So the women are just going there for free sex, or they are uh, wanting to, or chasing grooms, they are jihadi prides. And I'm sure most of you, if you are following the last three, uh, the, the case of uh, the three young girls who went to, uh, uh, to Syria from London, from North London, this is all what we have heard about them, or about their intention, why, why they have been, why they have decided to go there. But they were there because they wanted jihad and nikah, and they wanted to be jihadi brides. And uh, two days ago, one of, uh, of the girl's mother bigged actually the media. She was bigging the media, please don't talk about my girl as jihad brides. She's my baby, and I know she's not there because of that. She was crying, bigging the media not to put the, the, her girl in, in this position. And because we don't want to t understand why three brilliant A grades girls wanted to join ISIS and they don't want to, to be in, in London, we are just putting them in a particular position and particular uh, space because we see women, because they see women nothing but as a, a source of a pleasure and as sex commodity. So by this, they are objectifying objectification of 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 their act and alienate them from the whole engagement of uh, of politics. The the third and last. <laughs> Uh, aspect of alienation is the alienation from the products of the revolution. When we see that women were outside of the constitution making, women were actually not participating in the, the, uh, the, the reforming of the constitutions or, or laws, uh, but also, and uh, these constitutions come not to uh, recognize women's rights and what we have already been granted for women before, now is under renegotiation. So instead of having our rights and freedoms being uh, in these constitutions and in these law laws, we have to go now from the beginning and start to negotiate and renegotiate our rights, and we start to do these compromises. And even in Tunisia, where this effort hasn't been successful, but still to open the issue 
to negotiation again that women rights are com- uh, women are complementary of of uh, of men or uh, just a threat to women and just a, a sort of loss for women uh, that makes them all the time have to fight again and uh, and again the ngos laws in egypt for instance you know the, uh, part of the ngos challenge actually is uh, their proposals which has to be approved by the social development ministry can be rejected if it includes the word women's empowerment just this could be a <laughs> uh, 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 a reason for their proposal to reject in, in in Libya the same they are not allowed to use gender or equality because there are these are very uh, risky uh, risky issues equity is better or equal opportunities actually uh, so these kinds of of uh, you don't see as a woman you didn't see your, the results of the revolution part of you so you don't identify yourself with this revolution you don't look at it as as part of you so it becomes for women more alien and the, the revolution itself also alienate, uh, they are alienated from it, its results. Lens looking. I just want to uh, end by uh, a note that the impact and gendered impact of uh, the revolution, not just in, in, in countries where the revolution took places, but also in other countries like Jordan, where uh, it's uh, uh, believed to be immune to revolutions. But we see that what happens in, in, uh, in Egypt, in particular, impacted Jordan and made the regime wanted to make com- more compromises with the tribe, giving them more actually power because that the regime wanted to keep its power. So by that, we see so many instances now uh, against women because the tribes are uh, uh, openly uh, having their own uh, guns, actually, on the TV, in the parliament, on uh, everywhere in, in the country. And we have uh, uh, two days ago a case where a woman custody of her child, which is something unnegotiable in the law, it is granted. There is no way a man can take a child from her mother or his mother, unless there is a reason for that. And when you have a court decision, it is something impossible. But because he comes from a very influential tribe, and he is also rich, he managed to do that. And they put this woman, because she refused to give uh, the daughter to uh, to her father, they put her in, 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 in the prison. And the way she was out of her prison, actually it's related to the absence of law because she, went, she was arrested without any uh, legal, uh, uh, legitimate legal procedures and she was uh, released also without any legal uh, pro- procedures. Um, thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed, uh, Afif. So we now have Professor Nadil Ali from the SOAS Centre for Gender Studies to be our discussant, respondent, whatever you want to do. Oh, well, Thank of course, in 15 minutes. Well, yeah, yeah, I don't think it uh, will take me that long. I'm sure that there will be lots of questions. So I'll leave some time. I think uh, for me, one of the key, key questions of today and maybe in life is, uh, are there any compromises that are not rotten? Or maybe to put it differently, what does it take to have a compromise that's constructive and fruitful? And uh, maybe sort of to take a step back, clearly we all come to constitution making, the rule of law in the context of the Arab Spring from very different angles, disciplines and positionalities. I mean, as an anthropologist, when I look at constitutions and the rule of law, I pretty much look at them like I would look at Um, the Quran or the Bible or any other text for that matter, I'm interested in the way uh, that um, texts are interpreted, in the way texts are implemented, and the way they are sort of historically contingent and very much in agreement with Adam, of course, very much positioned, contextualized within specific political economies. And so, um, you know, the moment uh, we do that, uh, it really... Uh, is impossible, in my mind, from an anthropological perspective, to look at uh, the institution or the constitution as if it was sort of free floating. And for me, key in this debate is actually political authoritarianism and the way that political authoritarianism has intersected with constitution making and the rule of law. The rule of law can, of course, be 
you can have uh, laws, and I'm not a legal expert at all, but um, everything that I know about uh, women's rights and human rights in, in the region, um, I've worked on Iraq, for example, for a long time. I know that you can have laws uh, that are basically against human rights, but you could still call it a rule of law if we you know, go with that uh, category. So I think we need to be much more careful in terms of what kind of laws, what kind of legislation. Now, as a feminist scholar activist, one key question is really this question of compromise, and even I would maybe push it further, co-option. There's a long history, actually, of um, human rights activists, women's rights activists in the region having been co-opted by authoritarian states to push through certain legal reforms, um, most notably actually in Tunisia, but also to some extent um, in Egypt. And when it comes to constitution making, I, um, well, as I said, I mean, I've worked on Iraq, and there actually the question for many Iraqi women's rights activists after the invasion of 2003 was, do we engage in a process of constitution making or contestation of constitution in a context where the country is under occupation? This is, of course, an extreme case. We're speaking about Egypt and Tunisia. We're focusing on those two countries. You don't have occupations, but in the Egyptian case, you have um, a military dictatorship. And I actually uh, had long debates with a colleague, a friend of mine, who was one of the 50-member constitutional committee um, and agreed to be part of this committee in order to push through uh, more woman-friendly, gender-equal uh, basic rights in, in the Constitution. Now, I have to say I felt I was really troubled uh, when she agreed to do that, but I also have to say that um, I don't know what I would have done. I think it's very easy for us sitting in London to sort of judge people and say, you know, why would you? I'm not sure, and I think we have to be very careful in actually making making those judgments. But I think these are very difficult calls. These are calls that you know have long histories. And of course, if you're a feminist activist, more so than any other activist, more so than a human rights activist, more so than a, a Marxist activist, you're always actually under the accusation of betraying your country, being a puppet of the West, imitating the West. And so your political choices and strategies are even you know, more under scrutiny. Um, I um, want to uh, say something about political economy. I very much uh, agree with Adam that we um, need to look at the link between the specific um, you know, political regime, political culture, uh, politics more broadly, and the specific economy. However, I would slightly challenge him, challenge you, sorry, on the uh, link between I mean, when you're saying, okay, so I, I totally take your point that uh, there is there's a link between, or that there's this perception that democratization should go alongside neoliberal economics. And uh, we know, of course, that this is hugely problematic. Uh, but by the same token, I may know when I look, for instance, historically at um, Iraq under the Ba'ath in the 70s, you actually did have a state that very much used um, economics, a more welfare, I wouldn't call it socialist, but a sort of, you know, more distributive economics uh, as a way to actually co-opt a population and as a way to strengthen political authoritarianism and in a way to silence uh, people. So I think it goes into different directions. I don't think it's just neoliberal economics that um, sort of strengthen, strengthens authoritarianism. So um, finally, and then sort of linked maybe to uh, a Faf's paper, which is, of course, very close to my heart. I think that um, what is at stake in terms of constitution making and um, you know, rule of law is also um, the reshaping and rethinking of gender regimes. Inbuilt in constitutions and rule of law are gender norms, gender relations. And I think what we see now unfolding in the region is actually a coming together of a challenging or sort of trying to envision a new you know, political society and a new gender regime. And I think that if I have any hope, it's uh, the fact, I mean, I don't know if it's a fact, I mean, I, my perception is that 
we have a shift. In the past, women's issues, gender-based issues were always sort of second to the bigger struggles. So first we're going to liberate the country from the colonizers. First we're going to get rid of, you know, uh, the classes. We get rid of this oppressor or that. And then we will look at women's issues. I think that increasingly you have uh, especially younger generation of men who recognize that gender-based rights and equalities have to be central and key to a more equal uh, society. At the same time, of course, we have what uh, Denise Candiotti very eloquently um, coined masculinist restoration, where you have this, these counter-revolutionary backlashes by the authoritarian regimes, which are really also a form of sort of masculinist back backlash. So I think it's really important to look at um, those intersections. And I'm going to stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nadia. Right, would you like Nadia to carry on, or should we have some questions first? Because you had a few minutes left over. Let's have some questions first round, OK? I'll, get, I'll take three, perhaps, and then we'll... Oh, hello, Mashoud. And one more. Oh, hello, Samia. Good. I'm afraid I don't know your name, but you're first. Um, it's Aisha. I don't know if everyone can hear you or not. You need to speak up. There's a roving mic. It's roving your way with Martin attached to it <laughs> so far. Um, hello. First of all, I want to thank you all for your speeches. Um, and my question goes out to the full panel, but it actually uh, was brought up by Dr. I'm sorry, I might mispronounce this, Jabiri. Um, but it had to do with the authentication of the video of the courageous woman in Syria. And I don't contest her actions or that you know we are critical um, in a society of women who participate in activism. But with the backdrop, I attended a conference, um, which was the Arab Investigative Journalist Conference um, in Amman. And they discussed the issue of, during the Arab Spring, um, there are many self-proclaimed journalists with mobile phones or editors who go home and they just accumulate videos and put their own scope, and how that seems to affect the local politics, and they have no transparencies, they're very biased, and so what's the effect of this authentication of facts in the Arab Spring and the lack of authentication um, that transforms the traditional political activism in constructing uh, New Age constitutions that are happening now in the Arab Spring? Thank you. We'll take the next two off if that's OK. Uh, Masoud, Professor Badali. Oh, that's very efficient. Thank you very much. Um, I, I just want to make a basic point, but I think it's very, very important because, I mean, a lot of the time when we talk about constitutionalism, rule of law, we presume so much, and it has actually come out from Nadia's presentation and others. I mean, for example, many, my perception is, is it the case that uh, many of the Arab string countries, I mean, countries of the Middle East, even developing African countries, they are interested in doing constitutions, but they don't understand constitutionalism. You know, here, when you talk about constitutionalism, you understand the fact that, I mean, constitutionalism, I mean, uh, demands certain principles. We are talking about women's rights. We are talking about ordinarily this should be there. I mean, if you are not doing that, you are only just doing constitutions, but not following principles of constitutionalism. Do we need to really emphasize that rather than emphasizing constitutions? The same thing you talked about, the rule of law. And the first presenter talked about the fact that a country of laws. What I wrote down here was, I mean, which law? Now, for example, when I used to work in the Sudan, I mean, many of the crackdowns that the government do, when you talk, for example, in Sudan, when I was talking to um, the security agencies, they said they were not doing anything wrong. They were following rule of law. That is, the national security law was passed by parliament. It is good law of the country. They are following it. Therefore, it's the rule of law. Here, when we talk about rule of law, there are certain principles that you know must fall. So, I mean, are we putting the cart before the horse, really presuming that these principles, when we talk about constitutionalism, they are understood all over the world? When we talk about rule of law, they are understood all over the world. 
It might be basic, but I think it's a very important thing we might need to look at. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Badalin. We have Samia now, and then I think we come back here, and also uh, uh, Professor Fadal, I think, would like to come back on that last question as well when you finish, perhaps, on the constitutional issue. Is that right? Thank you very much. Thank you again for a really interesting uh, set of presentations. Um, it was just a um, uh, uh, first question, sorry, to Afaf, in, in terms of, um, um, I very much liked your presentation and looked at the um, the change in, or the shift in narratives in terms of presentation of women and women's autonomy and capacity. I was, w I, I, I was just wondering, when you were talking about women in your presentation, who were these women in terms of where they were based? Because linking it back to what Nadia was saying in terms of intersectionality or developing gender regimes erases the question right in terms of what intersectionality um, has Adam also talked about in terms of um, class and, 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 and politics and so in terms of women's narratives um, how, how do we kind of challenge that because I've also been working you know in, in, in terms of the UK um, and, and, and in terms of presentations of, of women, Muslim women. Okay, Adam, I really liked your presentation, and I just wondered um, very much in, in terms of the relationship of, yes, understanding the relationship between law and political economy, that um, these critiques also obviously very much apply in the West today, right? In terms of disempowerment, in terms of democracy, what do we mean by democracy and its relationship? So I wondered what you thought also um, of activists in the, let's just say, West, um, and in terms of their engagement or challenging, for example, organizations such as the IMF and others that seem to have greater and greater powers, or in terms of what we've just seen with what's going on in Greece, right? And in terms of then developing, you know, critiques um, in terms of um, what's going on in, in, in various parts of the world in terms of how we can challenge that. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Barno. Uh, that's the first round over. Who would like to start? Um, thank you for your questions, actually, and the question of uh, authenticity. Um, I'm aware that Daesh, whatever they wanted us, uh, we, know, we, we don't know anything about them, just what they wanted us actually to know and see. And they are restricting videos coming out of their, uh, of their uh, the controlled area in Iraq and Syria. And it's actually fascinating how before Daesh took control over these areas, we have seen so many videos coming from there. But now videos are becoming less and, and, and less. But for me, the issue of authenticity is not an issue because I know that these women exist. I know them because I, uh, I live in this region and I know that actually this woman looks like my grandmother. And I know my grandmother, if she's under this situation, she will just do the same. So that's why I'm not, uh, even if the, the video is fabricated, but the video, the way it has been made, it couldn't be fabricated because there were people talking from behind and they were talking about other issues in Arabic, which is not something that translated in English. So it looks like just a woman reading Quran to, to, to Daesh. But um, yeah, we do have this problem of, of, of all of, uh, of these videos. But for me, this issue of representation, which is related to women, that we cannot see them unless we question uh, their effort or we question if they actually do exist. Uh, I know that women in Iraq and Syria, who we don't know anything about them right now, they are doing even more than this, more than just challenging Daesh by, by, uh, by Quran. And uh, I'm sure after this ends, we will know more uh, about them. And the issue of intersectionality, um, I've said that the women I'm talking about, particularly in this presentation, uh, and who I try to apply the, the, the concept of alienation to them, were just activist uh, women, either in Yemen or in, uh, in Syria or in, in <coughs> Egypt, those who I've personally talked to and uh, through them I figured out that this kind of, uh, of, of loss and alienation from the whole process of, uh, of the revolution. Uh, but of course, if we are representing every woman in, in the region, we do have to take uh, class because uh, class and we have to take education and we have to take so many other issues. So for instance, women who are uh, under uh, 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 the, the one of the issues that I have been uh, presented actually, which is the very big challenge right now related to the early marriage in the region. For instance, women from poor areas who were part of the activism, 
were actually forced to marry, and I know some of them were forced to do so, while others who are coming from rich class were sent away to study, for instance. So there were so many ways in which those women, either by their families, because their, their families, after particularly the situation in Egypt in relation to the mass rape and uh, sexual harassment and etc., uh, they started to be restricted by their families and they started to be restricted by their uh, even friends not to go and participate in, in, uh, in the revolution and the and protests. So class, education, age, uh, all of these things play a, a significant uh, role in the ways in which women react actually to the uh, to this stage of, of the revolution. Thank you. Thank you. Hippa, do you want to respond to the constitutional question, I mean, Mashoud, perhaps? Maybe just very briefly. I mean, I, I wasn't at all claiming that using the Egyptian <laughs> legislative framework is an empowering an empowering tool in the least, right? Because if you apply any of the laws of the Mubarak era, you'd say nothing, do nothing, because there is, there is a provision in the penal code that would criminalize basically every form of speech. Um, so... The only remark I was making is that there was some space to use rule of law as a progressive notion um, around which to rally uh, for specific human rights reforms, and that that has now become a counterproductive way of framing things, basically, um, because of the very suave um, approach, I mean, I, because of the very smooth approach by the regime to kind of present the post coup authoritarianism and, and legitimize that in rule of law terms. Thank you. Can I maybe do this one? Oh, not this one. Evan? Uh, okay, just um, maybe a few comments uh, around uh, Nadia's points. So, and I, I mean, I, I agree very much that uh, authoritarianism is not unique to uh, neoliberal governments. And I, I agree very much also that the post-war or the post-Second World War Arab uh, nationalist states were uh, indeed, um, in, in many ways, very authoritarian. And a lot of the, the features of those states were actually uh, taken through into uh, the regimes that emerged through the 1980s and 1990s um, in the region. Uh, so, for example, the kind of corporatist union structures that existed and other kinds of ways of controlling society very much through um, the dominant party and, and these kinds of things were very much taken on board by Mubarak and, and others, I think. Um, but I think the turn to neoliberalism in the 1980s in the region was very much uh, uh, marked by this uh, uh, increasing authoritarianism, if you like, or it, 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 very much a centralization of, of decision-making powers in the hands of just a few individuals insulated from, from, the, wider, from the wider state. Um, it was connected. This wasn't just uh, Egypt and Tunisia. I think you can see the same processes in uh, Morocco, in, in Jordan, um, uh, uh, very much, very, very similar. So, uh, I mean, I take the basic point. Um, but there is, I think, uh, I think one of the, the ways that this kind of the state building debate is framed is this, uh, you know, this assumption that there is a uh, democracy and neoliberalism go together. And I think part of what we need to do in challenging that narrative is actually point out the record that they, they're very much interconnected. Um, on the Samuel's question around uh, the economic uh, or, or challenging uh, the IMF and other institutions in the West, uh, I mean, I think it's it's clear in the in the global context, the global economic crisis, that uh, we are seeing this emergence of an authoritarian neoliberalism <laughs> in the West as well. Um, I think that's very very clear. And and you know, at the beginning of the crisis in two thousand and eight, two thousand and nine, a lot of people said this is the end of neoliberalism. We're moving back to Keynesian solutions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But it's I think it's been shown to be completely false, any hopes that that would have been the case. Um, and that, uh, so I think it is important that uh, we see at this, this, this ch challenging by different activists. Um, my, my only kind of comment in relation to what we're talking about uh, or in the Arab world is that I think often the Arab region or the Middle East gets left out of these, uh, these debates and these, uh, these movements. Uh, you know, we talk a lot about Europe but we don't talk about the connections between Europe and the Middle East. Uh, and we need to remember, if there is a resurgence of crisis in Europe, uh, <coughs> North Africa in particular is going to be extremely, extremely hard hit. Uh, so I think that's something we need to kind of inject into these kinds of movements.
Thank you, Professor Muhammad Fadl. Um, uh, Hiba, very quickly, you talked about obviously all the problems in Egypt in terms of the police brutality and in culture of impunity, as you suggested. But I was curious to get a little greater sense of your notion of a positive sense of rule of law. We know what the Egyptian state is. It's a hyper-positivistic sense of rule of law. And to, I think, challenge that, one implicitly has to have a conception of law being higher. There's a, that, that, that law, there's a kind of law that exists higher than the positive formulations of the state. And where that law exists, obviously, is a ma matter of contention. But I would be interested to hear your conception of where such a law would exist in the Egyptian context. What is the source of a higher law in the Egyptian context that can be appealed, appealed to, to to confront the abuses of the Egyptian state? I mean, suppose tomorrow the Egyptian state passed a law that the police can shoot anyone on sight. Right? Under their positivist conception of law, they would say they're acting under the rule of law. I presume you would say that's not a rule of law. That's a misrule of law. But you would have to appeal to something higher than their mere statutory formulation. So what are the moral resources available to the Egyptian people to resist that? May I just ask you a question? Yes. Sorry. <laughs> I wondered whether you had a quick response to Masoud's question. I thought well, that I think was it's the same kind of question, the actually. Same, going to the it's same. the same kind of question. We'll have that, be, and then we'll hear back. You try to be more specific in about... Uh, okay. Good. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Tass out there. Do you want to take the mic? If anybody else has a question, try to catch my eye. Um, thank you. Uh, Thank you for great presentations. My, actually, I, my own work, I have seen many similarities between what's going on in the Middle East, which I described 30 years war, and uh, what was in 30 years war in Europe. And there is a long way to discuss about um, revolution and also constitution as well. And uh, I think Ottoman land is from, which start 1990s, from the Balkans, really uh, uh, melting as well. From that point, I would like to ask to Dr. Jabiri. We know that ISIS is directly referring uh, pre-Islam uh, 1632. And actually, they are critical of all interpretation of the Quran itself. And they are burning down the mosques. And if we, if we know this account, how they can uh, take account uh, one lady's description of the Quran? That's my first question. Second question, if... If that lady, okay, we, if we think that they took her account as a positive development of, how can you put this one as a gender development if other people who cannot read Quran, who cannot rise Quran, um, you know, other genders, which is Yazidis or other genders, can be under pressure, and how can you dis, uh, put this one under the gender development as well? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I have three more questions. We'll have to be a little brief because I think we're not going to run out of time, but uh, in, sorry, Martin, right on the other side and right in the middle, please. If I can find a more challenging one for you, I shall. But I can't. <laughs> So this might be in a bit of a different tangent, but I've been studying uh, women's uh, roles in democratization. And I was wondering, um, do you, this is a question for Dr. Jabiri and Dr. al uh, do you believe that the, the difference, the, the difference we saw in Egypt and Tunisia and, you know, the, the aftermath of the, the revolutions, do you think that has anything to do with uh, reflecting like the different progress of women's rights in the respective countries? And what would you say, could you comment maybe on that link? Please, thank you. Thank you. Uh, just right in front of you, yeah, please, thank you. Thank you, um, this is a question for Dr. Jabiri. Um, I thought your presentation was fantastic, really very, very thought-provoking. Um, I'm not an academic, and it really was very, very interesting for me. And I really liked what you said about the stage of the revolution that 
it, we're not uh, a situation where it's over. We're not in the aftermath of a revolution. We're just a, a, in a certain stage. And I just wondered what you thought the next stage was and what what kind of hurdles do you think need to be overcome, particularly for women, before there is more forward movement? Um, and also I wondered if you saw more of a more of kind of public ownership by women of their revolutionary activities in the future and also whose responsibility is that who, who is is it women's responsibility to take public ownership of their revolutionary activities or is it somebody else's responsibility or maybe it's everybody's or um i don't know interested in your views thank you just one more sorry martin it is true right down here I did not fix. I did not fix that. Oh no! Give us the pleasure of making part of it. <laughs> Since everybody else has to hear it, not just us. The point yeah, is, that's true. Sorry. Sorry. Thank you. Um, so this kind of goes back to the first panel, um, and I think the discussant in the first panel's questions around radical possibility, and one of the things you know throughout these two panels that I found kind of interesting was the way that the state remains stable and the language around the law is quite stable in the ways that it's discussed and I think this also goes back to this question of a positivist definition of the rule of law. So one of the things that I'm curious about is what has been the consequences of the law and the discourses of, on the law and the legal turn in this new kind of neoliberalized economy and politics to the ways in which organizers and activists and community leaders describe their demands and organize themselves. Um, I think the consequences, as far as I can tell, for example, around international law and the way that Palestinians organize have been really quite clear and illustrative. Um, but I'm curious as to, you know, sort of what is, how does human rights law and the way that that is framed how has that reflected the ways and the possibilities and the, fra the frames and the limits of organizing, um, organizing in Egypt and um, around issues like gender? Okay, thank you. Uh, shall we start with you, Afaf, or shall we? <laughs> okay. Um, just regarding the question related to um, uh, Daesh and uh, the, the woman, I for sure wasn't advocating for the interpretation of, uh, of Islam or of, of Quran or any uh, other sources. But what I wanted to show that, um, that knowledge of, of Quran or knowledge of any other knowledge that women have on the ground, they, they, they develop it through their own activities. They develop it, uh, they do have it. That's not just they are. Uh, ignorant or anything, that women do have their own knowledge, and through this knowledge, they can resist such kind of harsh practices of, uh, of, of, of Daesh. And of course, I wasn't showing that uh, through this case that Daesh, they were good to this woman. Maybe her age was uh, an aspect, actually, because she's really, really very, very old, maybe over 80. Or maybe, I don't know, they were not interested in, in anything. So it wasn't just an advocacy to show that uh, uh, the reading of her Quran or they are not doing this because she's reading Quran or because she's Sunni or whatever, because they don't know, actually, if she's Sunni or Shia or, uh, or from what, uh, what sect. But and this woman, for sure, knows that it is really dangerous to do this because she knows that Daesh do not differentiate between Yazidis or Sunni or, or Shia and they kill whoever would come in their own uh, their way. So that's why I wanted to show her case because she was really brave and I believe that this thing, even if this video is not authentic, this, some, this is something could be happening now in Iraq and, and, in, uh, and in, in Syria. Uh, in relation to the second question, which is really, uh, um, yeah, of course, as I said in my presentation, the revolution itself didn't come without women's contribution. Women were part of, women who made this reality, their sacrifices, their work all over the, the, the history, not just before the, before the revolution. So they made that a reality. It's just a matter that I was criticizing that it was not recognized in, in this way and it was shown as a state of exceptionalism. Uh, the other thing, um, where we are going, the sec second stage, what I can say right now, and I'm a bit hopeful in relation to 
uh, some aspects actually before the revolutions there are issues where we cannot demand publicly like the issue of having secular laws when it comes to family laws mm -hmm. we always asked for reforming family laws. Now we can see in Egypt, in Tunisia, Tunisia the situation, although it is uh, progressive, but it's still based on in Sharia. And we can see in Jordan, in Palestine, that there are women who are asking for secular rights uh, for uh, family issues and for their rights in, in relation to divorce, and etc. So this is, gives hope that even within this kind of extreme violence, chaos, uh, and absence of law, there is still hope because we see that the discourse of women and the demands of women are developing, are not going backward, and they are not staying. Okay, we do have a sense of stress, maybe the stress or of what's happening and who isn't actually in the world looking at the region and what's happening right now. But still, there are some hopes that we uh, there will be a second stage when I don't know, but what, from what I see, uh, of the level that we are working on, particularly when it comes to Sharia laws and family laws, that gives hope that we are continuing and in a second uh, level. Um, and uh, of course, it is responsibility for all. It's not just resp responsibility for women, because absence of women and discrimination against women. And I, actually, what I wanted to say that this discrimination and gender construction works well with with the state as part of their efforts to restore regime, regime's power. It's 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 a necessity for them, making women as commodity, objectification of their uh, of their act, or isolating of them and alienating them. It's part of their process of regime restoration, which shows that women matter, their issues matter, and it should be responsibility of everyone, not just uh, women. I hope I ask, uh, I answered all the questions. Thank you, Hiba. Thank you. Could I add a 20-second intervention on the women thing? No, just, just because, because I'm based in Egypt, it's difficult sometimes to see the, the optimism of that second phase that you're talking about, because there's a massive distinction today between women <coughs> who will criticize the security services for sexual abuse and detention, and women who thank Sisi for visiting the victims of sexual violence in hospitals, surrounded by you know, 10 other military men when she'd just been <laughs> mass raped the week before. Um, and, and this is the problem of corruption that we're talking about. And I wouldn't actually necessarily, the feminist that you're talking about, who at least tried to fight within the context of the constitution, I don't think she's the problem. I think the people who are the problem are the ones who are doing this public, um, because of course Sisi, like Jazam Mubarak before him, realizes that a few gestures on women's rights helps this, you know, this, I am this civilized pro rule of law, benevolent ruler. <coughs> and, and that's a difficult battle because if you're on the confronting the security services side, the cost of empowerment today is very high. And, and people are really yeah, living in fear. Yeah, they're indeed. Um, so so not, not, to, not to, and just to contextualize that, I, I, well, I want to keep going. I don't think, think, think there is. Going. <laughs> um, <laughs> as a Czech, um, the problem is, is that the Czechs right now are not operating. I was trying to use the Mubarak era analogy, uh, and not just 2011. I mean, 2011 is, is great because it's an example of what was possible within the structures of this political system and legal system. And one can always hold that up there and, and say, well, you know, if you can at least go back to prosecuting you know, six police officers over a period of five years, this is the Egyptian government produced these numbers for the UPR, they were very proud of it um, in, in 2010. I mean, that's better than where we are, where we are today. Um, I think the Constitution, this, co this Constitution does actually have some rights protections in them that one can use. Um, the only way one can use the, them is by trying to, to, to give meaning to, uh, to these laws that have always been on the books. I mean, we had 71 Constitution had some good rights protections in them as well. A lot of them are very vague, but the whole question is how you, through strategic litigation, use the laws that are on the books um, to give meaning to them. And, I, and I'll, I'll use that to just make a final comment to, to I think, your intervention. And, and we haven't really talked about socioeconomic rights because there's a very strong discourse on socioeconomic rights. Here again, um, I think the, it's not just the rights community, it's the rights and the left and the labor rights community have, 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 have been effective in, in using rights discourse, which has always kind of been out there because of Arab socialist heritage. Um, but, but that stays alive because the socioeconomic crisis, I mean, the ha very high expectations that people have after four years uh, remain very high. And so there, there is a bit of an opportunity there, I think, to, to use 
um, <coughs> socioeconomic rights and use the legal system as it exists right now to try and give some meaning to, to the rights protections that exist in the books. Thank you very much. We're going to have uh, Adam now and then Nadia, and I think we're going to wrap up. Okay, just very quickly, uh, I'll respond to uh, the question about the legal turn. Um, and, I, you know, just, I'm going to speak it fr on the basis of uh, Palestine again. Uh, and I, I agree very much um, with the point that uh, is being made that I, I, I think that there is, um, although it's useful at times to make appeals to, uh, to, to law uh, and to kind of human rights uh, principles, um, and this can, this can be very useful in terms of building movements and building solidarity with, with, in the case of Palestine, um, I don't think it can be the, the only basis or the, even the ultimate basis on which we um, actually look to build uh, movements or to find support or justification for movements. Um, and I think that comes back to what I was trying to say, that we need to say, see the way that legal forms uh, reflect in, in many ways power relations, and it's actually those power relations that we need to tackle and put up front, um, not that we shouldn't you know, use these kind of fora when they should, when they can be used, but um, to keep that in mind. Okay, just uh, also reacting to the question about um, differences between Egypt and Tunisia and whether um, they're reflecting the different progress of women's rights. I think the idea of um, progress of women's rights is, is problematic because it does assume a kind of linear and also uniform uh, situation. And I think we haven't very much talked about class, although, of course, we've talked about political economy. And I would say that, um, of course, when we speak about access to legal rights, class is so important. And we, you know, when I think about the urban middle class educated Korean women I know, um, there's not, I mean, of course they have problems, but in terms of access to legal rights, it's very, very different uh, to women in Upper Egypt who might be illiterate and do not even know what their legal rights are, not to speak of not being able to pay for a lawyer. So um, I think one big issue, of course, when comparing Egypt and Tunisia, that poverty, uh, I mean, political economy is quite different. I mean, poverty, um, economic crisis, unemployment is um, devastating in the Egyptian context, actually. I mean, of course, there are all kinds of economic issues in Tunisia as well, but I think it's on a very, very different scale. And then I would say that another difference is that the backlash has been very different and that we know that um, both Islamism and militarism or military regime are very strong uh, authoritarian patriarchal systems which um, often carry with them a backlash against women's rights. And I think that's what we see unfolding much more in, in the Egyptian context and in the Tun Tunisian context for all the various reasons that we mentioned before. Thank you. I'd like to... Don't clap just yet. I know you're really on the edge. I'd like to thank uh, this panel very much indeed. That was a, and a wonderful discussion. And thank you all for your contributions. I'd like to thank the panel, the earlier panel as well. And I'd like to thank on your behalf, Nimr Sultani, for <laughs> organizing this day. <laughs> would you like to come down and close up? Or have you got a roving mic up there? OK. So I, I would like also to. <laughs> So I would like, first of all, to thank uh, all of you for attending and for being here. I will, uh, and thank you all, uh, first of all, uh, as well, for my conference assistant, uh, Isabel Leach, and to all the speakers, discussants, <laughs> moderators. This has been fantastic. Thank you very much, and I look forward to more events. Thank you.